the end of the last class, we talked about different sorting methods, and the last one we looked at was uh, an algorithm called quicksort. And uh, quicksort is an algorithm where uh, you pick an element of the list, you call it the pivot, and then you look at every element in your list and you decide if it's bigger than the pivot or less than the pivot. Uh, so you end up with a sort of semi-sorted list uh, where you have the pivot in the middle, you have everything that's bigger than it at the end, and everything that's smaller than it uh, at the start, uh, and then you recurse. Uh, and you keep recursing until every little sublist has only one element left. And then uh, when, you're, when you're all done, you basically have a bunch of single element lists that are already in order. And so you can merge them very simply just by concatenating all your lists together. So look at the last lecture for, for how you exactly do that. Uh, I just want to reiterate that uh, in the example, we chose our pivot value to be the last value in the list. Uh, that's acceptable. Um, the big problem with this approach is that um, we can't guarantee the runtime uh, of the algorithm. So the algorithm, uh, how fast it runs basically depends on how good the pivot is. So a good pivot is a pivot that splits the list almost evenly, where about half of the elements are less than it and half of them are greater. And uh, as you recurse through the list, uh, that continues to be true. And so if you have a list, for example, that's already sorted, uh, what ends up happening is if you choose the last element as your pivot, all the elements are less than it. So they all end up in one group. And so uh, this is a, an example of divide and conquer. And so you're not actually dividing very well. You're, you're um, just taking one element off the list, taking another element off the list, taking another element off the list, and it will actually run in linear time. Um, so what we want to do is we want to pick a pivot that is going to maximize our chances of, of kind of splitting the list in half every time we use it. Uh, so instead of using the last element, we might use the mediant of the first, the middle, and the last, or we could choose a random element. Uh, so there's two ways of doing a random element. One is every time you pick a pivot, you pick one at random. Uh, the other way is that you just shuffle the list to begin with, and then you can just pick the last element uh, as you go through your code. Um, so why you would use uh, these different methods, uh, it depends a little bit. So the reason you might shuffle the list is because you already have a, a, an implementation of quicksort that uses, say, the last element or, or one of these other ones. Uh, if you shuffle the list, then you don't have to change the algorithm itself. Uh, so in a, in a scenario where you're reusing code, that's when you might use this. And the other thing is that implicitly, you're probably thinking of the list as an array. If it's an array, finding the first, the middle, and the last element is simple. Uh, you just know how big the list is, and then you can uh, do the math to figure out which, which indexes you should be looking at. But we're not saying that it's necessarily an array. What if this is a positional list? What if this is, a, like for example, implemented over a link list? Finding that middle node is actually kind of hard, right? You, there, you don't have a direct pointer to the middle node. You have to start at the, at the first and, and traverse the list in order to find that middle node. Same thing with a random node. I can generate a random number, and it says 5. Uh, for, but for me to uh, walk through the list and, and actually pick out the fifth element, uh, I'm gonna, that's going to be a linear time operation. So none of this will impact the overall time complexity, uh, which is going to be O n log n. So even looking through a, link, uh, a linked list or something like that for an index would, would uh, be a linear operation. Um, but uh, anyways, uh, if, if you want to shuffle a linked list, you can do that you know, fairly, um, you can do that fairly easily. You can guarantee that it runs in and in, in log in time. Um, so even shuffling has a certain amount of complexity with it. But anyways, uh, the idea here with quicksort is uh, you can get n o log n, but this is going to be expected time. And it's going to be premised on the assumption that you're able to pick good pivot values that split your list. OK, the other thing I'll just note very quickly about quick uh, sort is it can actually easily be adapted to uh, a different problem we call quick select. So select would be, um, let's say that you want to find, uh, for example, you want to find, uh, if you sort the list, uh, once you have a sorted list, it's easy to pull out, say, the fifth element in the list. Um, so if you want to, if you have an unsorted list, however, you can write an algorithm that will just do that for you. So uh, what it will do is it will return the ith largest or smallest 
uh, element in the list. So for example, the median itself uh, is considered the middle element of the list. So let's say you want to write an algorithm that finds the middle element. It's not gonna start the whole list for you, it's just gonna find that middle element. And it works exactly the same. So you pick a pivot, uh, you put all the elements that are less than it and all the elements that are greater than it. And then let's say you're finding the fifth element. What you do is you just sort of count this up. Is there more than five elements here? If there's more than five elements here, you know that the fifth element will be here, right? If there's four elements here and this is your fifth element, then you're already done, you found it. And let's say there's two or three elements here, there's an element here, and then uh, the fifth element's going to end up on this side, okay? And so the point is that after you do this division, you're able to throw out uh, two of these things, right? You, you know explicitly whether it's the pivot or not. If it's not the pivot, you can throw it out. And then it's either in the less than or it's in the greater. Uh, so that you can throw one out and then you can recurse on the other. And then you do the exact same process. You pick a pivot, you split it into three groups, and then you keep repeating it. And eventually you'll find uh, the ith element. Uh, and at every step of the algorithm, you're able to kind of throw away half of your list uh, so that you, you don't have to look at uh, the, entire, the entire thing. Um, so this is another operation that's going to take and log in time. Okay, so we've seen a, a bunch of different sorting algorithms. Uh, what, you know, what, which ones are good, which ones are bad? Um, so this is just from Wikipedia, uh, so you can go and, and look at it, but it's a nice kind of summary of, of some of the things that we've seen. Uh, we didn't talk about all of these, but we talked about most of them. Uh, so we have quick sort and merge sort. Uh, we talked about heap sort, we talked about insertion sort, and we talked about selection sort. We didn't uh, talk about these other ones. Uh, this is just an in-place version of merge sort. I'll note that for, for all of the algorithms that we talked about, there are in-place versions. Uh, so in-place means that um, you don't have to create a new data structure uh, to, to hold the data. Now, sometimes you do have to keep, create a data structure that's going to keep track of um, where you are in the recursive method, like how, how much work have you done or not done. Um, and so in that case, you might have some sort of little uh, data structure that's just going to remember, you know, how many times have you recursed, uh, how many more times you have to recurse, what do you have to recurse on, what you don't have to recurse on, those types of things. So. Uh, memory complexity is actually in this chart. Um, so worst case is what we're normally interested in. So that's big O. Uh, so you have these three uh, are n squared. So insertion and selection we know is n squared algorithms. And quick sort we know that it's n squared worst case. So for example, if you pick your pivot as the last element and it's already a sorted list, you'll hit n squared. Uh, but on average, if you randomize your pivots uh, you can expect uh, n log n. Uh, so this is expected or average time. Um, and then for we didn't look at expected for the other algorithms. Uh, and then in terms of n log n, so we have quick sort is expected n log n, merge sort is n log n, and heap sort is also n log n. Um, you can think about the memory complexity. There's this other property uh, which is called stability. And stability basically says that if you, um, if you sort an algorithm, let's say that you have a, a, an original list. And let's say that you have some ties. So let's say you have K1 uh, and then you have K2 and then you have K1 again and then you have K3. And you might say, well, what it, why do you have a tie? Well, the values could be different. So you're actually storing key value pairs. Um, so K1 might have one value, and this other K1 might have a different value. Um, so this emerges uh, when we think of multi-sets. Uh, so generally, a set is defined as only having one key. Uh, but in a multi-set uh, or a dictionary, uh, you might have multiple values uh, that have the same key. So think of them as definitions of English words, for example. So the key is the English word. Uh, so the dictionary is sorted by key, and then you have value as well, okay? And so um, what will happen is if we assume one, two, and three are, are sort of the right order, uh, we're gonna have a sorted list, and the sorted list will have the two K1s, 
the K2 and the K3. And the big question is, how did we decide which K1 to put here and which K1 to put here? Okay, um, so is it the case that uh, it looks like this, or is it the case that K1, the first K1 here got put in the second spot and uh, the second one got put in the first spot? Okay, um, so some algorithms are arbitrary. There's no guarantee. Uh, which K1 or which K1 ends up in which position just depends on the algorithm. It sort of depends on where it happened to be when you did some splitting or when you did some merging, that type of thing. Okay. Other algorithms uh, will always have the property that uh, if K1 appeared first in the unsorted list, it will appear first in the sorted list. Okay. Um, and so that's an algorithm that we call stable. So a stable algorithm is an algorithm that has that property. Um, so I'll just uh, try and delete the, the unstable line here. Okay, you don't have to watch me struggle with that. Um, all right, so a stable algorithm. And later we'll talk about something called radex sort, and, and it's a really nice algorithm that assumes uh, you require a stable algorithm for it. Okay, so the stable algorithm uh, ties are handled in same order as input. Okay. And basically what we'll do is sometimes you want to sort, you want to define a tiebreaker. So you're like, if these two keys are the same, then we're going to look at the value and we'll take the first value or the shortest value or something like that. And when you have stable algorithms, what you're able to do is you're able to basically sort the list a couple different times according to the different tiebreakers and then sort it by the main, um, the main key. And then it will turn out to be sorted in the right order where, the, the, where you have the right set of tiebreakers in the right set of orders. But we'll, we'll circle back to this. This becomes more important uh, when we talk about something called radex sort, okay? Um, but anyway, so heap sort doesn't give you any sort of guarantee uh, and selection sort doesn't. Uh, insertion sort, uh, merge sort uh, will, and quick sort can also be made uh, to, to be uh, stable if you want it to be, okay? Uh, this tells you, it just gives you a sort of keyword to think about what the main mechanism is that you're using. All of these algorithms I'll note are something we call comparison sorts. So all of them have a one method that's in common, which is that they're doing a comparison. So a comparison is looking at two elements of the list and saying this one's bigger, or this one's smaller. Uh, so all of them use a comparison and we'll talk in general, what's the best that you can do if you only do comparisons? And then we'll look at some algorithms that don't use comparisons as well and what their advantages are, okay? Now, of all of these algorithms, we still have the remaining question of, of which would we, prefer to be, would we prefer to use? And so we can see that, that it's, especially in terms of time, time complexity, insertion sort and, and selection sort don't look very good, and it's kind of a tie, three-way tie between these. Now, in practice, what's, what's often used uh, is merge sort, and the reason is for this, uh, we mentioned this last class, which is it's highly parallelizable. Uh, so what happens is that um, when you do merge sort, what you do is you split a bunch of elements into smaller and smaller chunks. And then eventually what happens is that um, you have to sort these smaller lists, okay? And the smaller lists you can give to different uh, processor. So let's say you have a GPU, a GPU is able to, to do like parallel processing. So for every core that you have on your GPU, you can give it one of these sublists. So you, you start on a single core and you start partitioning your list. And then once you have it split into 100 elements, you give one to each of the 100 GPUs. They solve it for that particular, um, for that particular list and then you merge it uh, back together. Okay, so this idea of uh, taking a big problem, splitting into smaller problems, giving it to a bunch of parallel processors that will solve it, and then merging the results back. That's a general kind of template. 
Um, so MapReduce is another sort of general framework for algorithms that, that follow this kind of principle. And so anyways, it, it, it shows up a lot. The other nice thing about merge sort is once you get your lists and they're small enough, uh, what you can do is you don't have to use merge sort to sort the smaller lists. So you can use merge sort to partition them into small enough lists that you could, for example, use insertion sort or selection sort, which are n squared. Okay, so they're they're really terrible in terms of worst case, but they're not actually that bad uh, when when you think about actual wall time. Okay, so this n squared you really feel when n gets really really big, but for small n's they can actually be really fast. And so what you can do is you can kind of chop your lists up into smaller and smaller lists, uh, split them up amongst different cores. Uh, the different cores will do insertion sort or selection sort, and then you can start merging things uh, back together. Uh, so we call that a hybrid algorithm uh, where you're you're using different sorting methods. Um, and and that that's great. So a parallelizable hybrid uh, algorithm is is sort of um, is is one of the most competitive algorithms and and most of them use like sort of these kinds of principles uh, when when you look at uh, doing sorting in, in real world industrial use. Okay, now the next topic I want to talk about is uh, comparison sorts in general. So all of these algorithms at some point inside the algorithm, they take two elements from the list, we'll call them A and B, and they do a comparison between them, like a compare to kind of operation if you want to think in terms of Java. Okay, and if A is bigger than B, it does one thing, and if B is, is bigger than A, then it does some other thing. Okay, so there's two uh, sort of actions. So we'll think of action one and action two. Okay, then it will compare, it will find some other elements to compare uh, whatever. But the point is that this is like kind of the, the base unit, uh, the base computation that underlies all of these algorithms. So the question I want to ask is, if you're going to sort a list using comparisons, um, you know, we see that, that uh, n log n looks like the smallest, at least in terms of worst case uh, complexity, it, look, it looks like the best that we can do. Okay, and so is it true? Is it true that, that you need to do n log n? And so it turns out that it is actually true. I'll write this down as a theory. Um, so worse, in the worst case, uh, all comparison-based algorithms, so algorithms that are using this comparison as, as the primary mechanism, Uh, require uh, so lower bound is they're going to require n log n time so there, there's no way that you're going to do it faster um, now you might say well wait a minute there I know some algorithms that are faster than n log n for sorting well they're not comparison based okay so uh, anything that that uses this comparison uh, will require theta log n okay uh, so I'll sketch out a proof of this and uh, put the emphasis on sketch. This will not be a formal proof. I'm just going to give you the intuition of what the proof looks like. Okay, so think about um, something like this. So we have an unsorted list, and this is our input. And what we're going to do is we're going to pick two elements out of this unsorted list. I don't care what two they are. Uh, it will depend on the algorithm, but we're going to do a comparison uh, between the two of them. And then uh, based on the results of the comparison, we'll either do one thing or we'll do another. Okay, we'll either do action one or action two, and I don't care what action one or action two is. The point is that there's only two possible actions that you can do, okay? Um, then what will happen is you'll pick another two elements out, okay, and you'll either do action one or action two, and then you'll repeat this And then finally, at the end of the day, you'll have a sorted list. Okay, and the question that we're asking ourselves is basically, 
how many of these comparison operations do you have to do? Okay, and we don't know. We actually don't know how long this chain is. Okay, but what we do know is, first off, it, it, it's kind of a tree, right? So even if, if you go over to, uh, to do the second action, then you're going to do another comparison. It will have two outcomes. Then you'll do another comparison. It will have two outcomes. And so this ends up being, uh, we have a binary tree. And every possible sorting of the list, okay, so every possible sorting will have a leaf node, okay? So the, the leaf nodes will be, basically, if you start with a list, think of it like this. Let's just think of one element. This is sort of a middle element in the list. Um, this middle element could stay in the same place. It could end up here. Uh, it could end up here. It could end up here, could end up here. So it could end up in any one of these positions. And that's true of every other element, right? So this element could end up here, or it could end up here, it could end up here. Obviously, the same element can't end up, two different elements can't end up in the same slot. Uh, but there's lots of different possible sortings uh, that could come out the other end. So the question is, how many? How many possible uh, ways of sorting a list are there? And the answer is n factorial. Okay, so there's n factorial possible sortings, or you can think of it as permutations. So if you take this list and you sort it, you're basically sort of shuffling things around. So anytime you have a list uh, that's n elements long, there's n factorial possible shufflings of that list or reorderings of the list or permutations, okay? So we know this is a binary tree. We don't know how long the path length is. That's, that's what we're trying to establish. Uh, but what we do know is we do know how many leaf nodes there'll be. Uh, there'll be n factorial uh, leaf nodes because there has to be one for every possible outcome. Okay, so with n factorial possible leaf nodes, and if this is a binary tree, then we can actually figure out what the height is, right? We can figure out how many nodes, how many, uh, how, how, uh, what height of a tree do we need so that we can fit n factorial leaf nodes in the tree, okay? And uh, there's a, a closed form expression. I'm just going to um, express it in broad terms. Uh, so broadly, it's going to be the logarithm base two because it's a binary tree of n factorial. And this number ends up being n log n, okay? Uh, so what that means is that the path length of this is going to be n log n. Uh, and since at every depth of the tree you're doing a comparison, you're going to have to do n log n comparisons in order to start with an unsorted list and have the possibility of reaching any one of these different leaf nodes. Okay, uh, so this is the number of comparisons. Okay, so this is a, a very strong theory. All right, now as I hinted, you can actually do better than n log n time. Um, so you can beat the n log n bound by doing uh, things other than comparisons. But in general, the things that you would do other than a comparison tend to be not as generic. And so usually they come with some constraints. Like this algorithm is not going to work on every single list. Uh, there's going to be some assumption that you make or some constraint on the list, uh, which is going to limit it. Uh, and, and then you can sidestep this having to do a comparison. So comparisons are very general. You can do it on any kind of list. Doesn't matter what the keys are, what the values are, as long as you can actually do that comparison operation. Uh, so all lists can be sorted uh, in n log n, but if you have special cases, lists that look a certain way that have certain constraints, then we might be able to do it faster, okay? Um, so what are those constraints and uh, what are those, those uh, operations other than a comparison that you can do? Uh, so that's what we'll talk about next. 
So here's an example of something that is not a comparison base operation that will let us beat the n log n bound uh, for sorting algorithms. So this is called bucket sort. It's a very simple algorithm. Um, but we're going to put some restrictions on the things that we want to sort. So let's take the example that we've used all along, uh, which is we have a bunch of integers. And in particular, you'll notice that uh, these integers happen to be two digits. Okay, so they're from the range 0 to 99. Um, and let's say that we want to actually make that a constraint. Okay, so we're going to say that we're only going to sort integers uh, from 0 to 99. They can't be any bigger than 99. Okay, so that's, it's not a general sorting algorithm. It's not going to work with all data. We have this constraint on it. But uh, if we're willing to accept that constraint, uh, then we can do things that are, are a little bit uh, faster, or quite a bit faster, actually. Um, so bucket sorts are actually a, a really nice, simple, elegant algorithm where what we do is we set up an array. And uh, in this case, we'll assume that the array has indexes up to uh, the maximum number. Uh, so we'll take it up to 99. And then what we do is we uh, can call this array A. What we do is if 85, if we want to put that, uh, if we want to sort it, uh, that's our key. What we do is we just put it in uh, the 85th slot in our array. Okay, 24 will go in the 24th slot. Sixty-three will go in the sixty-third slot. Okay, and uh, notice that this takes O one time, constant time. Okay, so that's great, and we're going to do it for all of the elements in our array. So let's assume that we have n, as we as we typically do. Um, let me call it small n. Uh, so let's say that we have n elements to sort. Uh, we're going to do uh, 01 operations uh, n times, one for each element. Okay. Uh, then what we'll do is we have this array, and the nice thing is we can just walk through the array and print out the elements in the, the order that we see them. Uh, and what will happen is they'll come out in, in sorted order. Okay. Uh, so step one is we load the array up. Uh, so we do constant time operations, uh, one for every element in our original list, and then we traverse um, A. Uh, and so this is going to take O, uh, in this case, let's call it M. Uh, so M is the, the, the size of the array. Okay, so in this case, we have 99 uh, elements in our array or the capacity of our array is, is, is well, it's 100. Uh, we have 100 slots, and so we'll call that M, okay? Um, so the total, uh, so this will come out in sorted order. And then the total complexity uh, will be O N plus M, okay? And in particular, there's no reason why M and N can't be the same number, right? If all these keys are unique, and let's say we have exactly uh, all the numbers from 0 to 99, uh, M and N could be the same number. In that case, we get O of N plus N, uh, which is 2N, uh, which reduces to O N, okay, which is linear. Um, but even if M is slightly bigger than N, um, it will still be a linear uh, time operation will just be linear in the size of uh, basically our constraint here. So, so what integers we're considering. Okay, uh, so this is a linear time operation. And the reason this works, uh, the reason that we beat that n log n is there's no comparison. So we're not comparing anything. And in particular, for example, uh, let's say that, that we have 85 and 24. If we compare them in a comparison-based sort, all you learn is 24 is less than 85. That's the only fact that you learn. But in this case, you're, you're actually encoding kind of more information. For example, 
85 is a lot bigger than 24, right? And that, that's represented, like if you look at this array, you found 24 and then you start counting the number of empty slots until you reached 85, you'd realize, oh, 85 is actually a lot bigger than 24, right? So there's all these, these predicates or, or these, these uh, amounts of information that you can determine from this. So this is recording a lot more than just a simple comparison. Yes, it's true that this number is bigger than this or, or it's smaller than this. Uh, and so that's why, because you're sort of encoding more information, you're able to do uh, your sorting algorithm uh, in less operations. Uh, but the downside is that we have this, this constraint, so it's not going to work in general. Uh, in particular, uh, it works really nice when they're integers. Uh, if these aren't integers, for example, let's say they're strings, then you would have to map them into indexes into an array somehow. That's not too hard. I mean, you can assign... Uh, characters to, to, to numbers uh, and, and map it. Um, but, but there is another trick uh, which we can play. Uh, so this is going to be the radex sort algorithm. And uh, the key idea here is um, radex sort uses bucket sort. Um, as, as a sub-protocol. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to use bucket sort. And what we're going to do is we're going to assume that we have a, a multi-map instead of a single map, which is a fancy way of saying that uh, we allow uh, the same key more than once or to be repeated. Okay, and once we allow the key to be repeated, then we can ask the question of, is this a stable algorithm? Uh, so if there's a tie and two keys are the same, uh, is the output of the sort uh, going to preserve the order of those two keys uh, based on the input? Okay, and so it turns out that for bucket sort, well, first off, notice that, let's say we have 24 twice, uh, what we need to do is we need to actually create a kind of data structure here that's going to hold all the different 24s, okay? Um, so this is much, this is very much like a hash table. Uh, the only difference is with a hash, you're mapping it to a random location. This, in this case, we're, we're mapping it to a, a kind of known uh, location. Um, but uh, we're going to allow the same key to be repeated. Uh, therefore, we need... A bucket and that's why bucket sort is called a bucket uh, it actually assumes that that you're gonna do these multi maps anyways uh, so we need a bucket uh, data structure and if we use a queue first in first out uh, then uh, whichever element is first say there's a bunch of 24s in our input list we'll add them and then later when we traverse the list and pull them back out, it's going to be first in, first out. Okay, so the first ones that will come out were the first ones that we put in. And that's the definition of a stable algorithm. Okay, uh, therefore, uh, sort will be stable. Okay, so this allows us to do two things. Um, so one thing is the, the sort of non-fancy thing, and then we'll talk about the fancy thing. Uh, the non-fancy thing is uh, sometimes you, you want to sort by multiple keys. Sometimes if you have a tie in the key, then you'll look at the value and you'll try and sort on value, or sometimes you have multiple keys that you want to sort by. Um, so for example, let's, let's choose an example where um, uh, let's say that you, uh, well, okay, I'm, so I'm a big fan of soccer. So let's say that we have uh, soccer teams. And you want to know uh, what's the standings of the league. So which team is in first place and which team is in second place. So let's say that we have three seat teams. And uh, in soccer, you have a point system. Uh, so you get three points for a win one point for a tie, zero points uh, for, for a loss. Uh, so, so in the middle of the season, maybe um, 
team A is, has 50 points, uh, maybe this team has 48 points, and maybe this team has 48 points as well. Okay, And then what you'll have is you'll have other tiebreakers. Uh, so if the two teams are tied, then you might look at things like who has the most wins, what's the goal differential, there's a bunch of different statistics. So let's just keep this really simple and we'll say that we have wins as well. Uh, worked out these numbers before, but uh, let's say that uh, we have uh, 15 wins, 16 wins, and 14 wins. Okay, um, and actually let me invert these just so that it doesn't come out in the right order. Okay, um, so in this case what the standings should be is team A should be in first place because they have the most points. Team B and C are going to be in second and third place respectively and team C will win on the tiebreaker. Uh, so so we, the correct ranking would be A, C, B. Okay. Now the question is how do, how do we write an algorithm? So we can certainly sort uh, the list by the first key. Uh, so we'll call this key one. Uh, and then what we can do is we can say we can walk through the list and find all the tiebreakers and then, or all the ties, and then look at the tiebreaker criteria. So you could think of an algorithm that, that maybe uh, would model this. But there's a much simpler algorithm, uh, one that you don't have to think so hard about. Okay, And that is what we'll do is uh, we'll take our list and we're going to sort it actually twice. Uh, so we're going to first store it, sort it based on wins. Uh, then we're going to sort it based on points. And if it's stable, uh, whichever team came out on the tiebreaker when we sorted by wins, that ordering will be preserved uh, when we store by points. Okay. So in other words, if we have uh, a primary key and then a secondary key that's used uh, as a tiebreaker, uh, what we can do is uh, and the, the tricky thing here is that we do it in reverse order. So we first sort uh, by the tiebreaker, and then we sort by the primary thing uh, that we want to sort by. Okay. Um, so this is the, the key idea of radex sort, is we sort by key 2, uh, then we sort by key 1. Okay. We're going to assume that this is stable, okay? So it's going to come out right, and, and we'll, we'll work the example. I'll show you uh, what that looks like. Um, and uh, the nice thing here is that we can do bucket sort, okay? And for bucket sort, uh, notice that the most number of points is 50, the most number of wins is 15, 16, something like that. And if we were to push these keys together, another way we could do is sort of you could think of some way of, of sort of combining these two keys uh, together, but then you would get a much bigger uh, data structure that you would need. So by able by by splitting these keys up, uh, what we can do is we can make sure that the the that each key is is actually relatively small. Uh, then we can use something like bucket sort um, uh, to to do the actual sorting. Okay. Uh, so, so in this example, what we'll do is we'll, we'll uh, first, so in the example, we'll sort by key two first. So what we'll do is we'll get, um, now in this case, we want to sort with the highest uh, first. Uh, so C has 16. wins, uh, A has 15, and B has 14. Uh, so 16, 15, 14. And then their respective points are uh, 48. A has 50, and team B has 48. OK. Um, so we'll, we'll sort that. And then what we'll do is we'll sort uh, by key, t key one, okay? And so A will go to the top. Then C and B are tied, and so the idea of a stable sorting algorithm is that C, because it appears first in this list, it's going to appear first in this list, and B, because it appears second in the input, 
it's going to appear second in the output. Okay, so it's going to preserve the order, and that's exactly what we want because C in this list uh, it's sorted by key two, which is the number of wins, and so C has more wins, so we want uh, it to appear before B. Okay, so C will come in at 48 uh, with 16, and B will come in with 48 at 14. Okay, and so this is correct in the sense that it's sorted first by points, and when there's a tie, it's sorted uh, by the tiebreaker. And so you can extend this out uh, by multiple keys. Uh, so let's say you have key one, two, three, four, uh, and you just repeat this process where you start at the, the last tiebreaker and then work your way back uh, to the primary key that you want to sort by. Okay, uh, what's the time complexity of this? Well, you're just doing bucket sort twice. Okay, so if bucket sort is linear, doing it twice is two times a linear amount. Uh, and so this will, will be linear as well. Um, so it's going to be linear in uh, the array size of bucket sort. Okay. And so this is an example where the keys were already split up into two separate keys. Okay. The final trick that we can do with radex sort is we can take keys that aren't split up. We can take keys that are just normal uh, values of keys, and then we can split them up as if they are uh, different keys. Okay, um, so the final trick So let's go back to this example. Um, what we can do is we can pretend instead of this being the number 85, we could pretend that it's sort of like two keys, eight and then five. And this is two keys, two and four. And this is six and three. And this is four and five. This is one and seven. This is three and one, nine and six, five and zero. And the point is that if you think of this as two digits, if you want to sort these numbers, what you're really doing is you're sorting by the most significant digit, okay? And then if there's a tie, then you're going to sort by the least significant digit, okay? So um, that's what a sorted order of these of all these numbers are. Now, unfortunately, in this set of numbers, there are no actual ties. So let's let's add another number where uh, we take some of the numbers that have, have already appeared on, on both the most significant and least significant. So let's just add 56 to the list, okay? Um, so the idea here is we sort uh, first by uh, least significant digit, okay? Uh, and then we'll sort by most significant digit, okay? Uh, so by least significant digit, uh, if we wanna make the biggest one appear first in the list, uh, the biggest one is 7, okay, uh, so 17. Uh, the next biggest uh, is 6, so we have 56. Uh, the next biggest is, uh, we also have a 96 as well, so since this is stable, the 96 will appear uh, before the, the 76. Uh, so we have 96, uh, 56. Uh, the 17 is gone. Uh, we have a 0, a 1, a 5, a 3, a 4, and a 5. So the two 5s will go next. It's stable, so we'll do it in the same order. So 85, 45. Uh, the next biggest is the 4, 24. Then the 3, uh, 63. Uh, then the 1, 31. And then the 50. Okay, so what we did is we basically sorted it by the least significant digit. And so you can see this set of numbers are sorted in terms of, of these numbers here, okay? Uh, and if we use bucket sort, the difference is uh, before we had to have an array that was size 100. Now, because we're just sorting by this one key, uh, we only need an array of size 10. So an array of size 
10. So that's a much smaller array, okay? Then what we'll do is we'll repeat the trick for the next significant digit. And once again, we only need an array of size 10. We can use the same array uh, if we want, okay? Uh, so then, then we do most significant digit, okay? And so if we look at just the most significant digit, uh, we see that 90 is first, uh, then 85, uh, then 63. Then we have a tie. Uh, so we have two fives. Uh, and because uh, we're doing it uh, stable, then we'll do it, uh, the output will be in the same order as the input. And notice the input is already sorted by the next least significant digit, okay? So because six comes before zero, we have the bigger number on top. So 56, at 50 anything will always be in the correct order uh, in this, this list, and this list is going to preserve it, okay? So we'll put 56 next, and then we'll pull the 50 up here. Uh, then we'll, we'll keep going. So we have a 45, we have a 31, we have a 24, and we have a 17. Okay, so this is a list that you can think of as it's just in sorted order, okay? But, but a different way of thinking about it is it's sorted by most significant digit from biggest to smallest. And if there's a tie, then the tiebreaker is what's the biggest least significant digit. So that's a different way of thinking about actually sorting a list. And the big thing here is that um, we need an array of size 10 to do the first sort and an array of size 10 to do the second sort, okay? So this is like O10 work uh, as opposed to O100 work. Now, all of this is linear, uh, so we didn't do any uh, savings in terms of actual time complexity, big O time complexity. Uh, but in terms of wall clock, uh, in terms of actual uh, speed, this is a much faster algorithm uh, because your array size was a lot smaller, okay? So any kind of key that you can sort of decompose into smaller kind of chunks, uh, you can use radex sort on. So numbers work well, uh, strings uh, also, so you can sort by character uh, for, for what's called the lexicographical sort. Uh, you have to pay a little attention of, of when your strings are different lengths. What does that mean? Uh, you know, is, is, a, is a three character string bigger or smaller than four character string? And so um, here you can add leading zeros. Uh, in the string case, you would add kind of leading null characters on the end so that they all end up being the same size. But anyways, you can think of that as an exercise about how you would use this approach uh, to sort a string. Uh, but it will work. Uh, so it will work for, for all sorts of different um, kinds of, of uh, keys that can be split uh, into smaller uh, components. Uh, so that's that's radex sort. Okay, um, so anyways, this, this is all uh, that I want to say about uh, different sorting algorithms. The next topic we'll move into to grass, which is the next uh, chapter of, of the book. me but let me say actually one one final thing about um, about radex sort so I, I just want to make sure that uh, we see the time complexity because uh, it's a little more complicated uh, than, than what we indicated okay so this is the actual proposition straight out of the textbook and so uh, you can see the time complexity it looks kind of weird uh, we have a D we have an N and we have a big N okay uh, the N plus N that's coming from the fact that we're using bucket sort, okay? So n is going to be the number of key value pairs that we have, okay? So it's, it's sort of the input list. Um, so if, if we look up here, the number of elements here is, is going to be n, okay? So n uh, pairs. And then we're going to do an array of a certain size of a certain capacity and that capacity is going to be capital N. Um, so this is the capacity of the array that's used in bucket sort. So in this case, uh, it was 10. Okay. Now, because we have collisions, because we it's a multi-map, so you can have the same key, um, 
this could be bigger or smaller than n. So usually if, well, first off, strictly speaking, if uh, it's a mapping, meaning uh, that you can't repeat keys, uh, then n it has to be strictly bigger than n. The, the, you could have a quality and that's it. Uh, but here you could have a little n that's bigger than a big n if you wanted as well in a multi-map setting. Okay, so you, basically you take the maximum of these two when you're thinking about them, but they're both linear at the end of the day. Okay, uh, and then d is uh, we repeated this process. So we took little n keys, uh, we put it in an array of 10 elements, uh, 10 elements here, and we did it twice. We did it once for the least significant digit and once for the most significant digit. Okay, so the number of sort of decompositions you can think of as D. Uh, so D is the, the number of, of splits uh, in, in the data structure or the number of keys. So I'll say number of uh, sub keys. or digits, if you want to think of it in terms of numbers. Okay, uh, so it's the number of digits times uh, the sum of uh, the number of elements and the capacity of the array, okay? N is because you have to touch every element to put it in the array. Big N is because you have to traverse the array to pull all the elements out in sorted order. And then D is because you're gonna to have to repeat this uh, for uh, your primary key and all the tiebreaker keys as well. Okay, so anyway, that's the, the proposition. This is what it looks like uh, in terms of actual uh, complexity time.